John Muir wrote these words about Yosemite. Nowhere, nowhere will you see the majestic operations of nature more clearly revealed beside the frailest, most gentle and peaceful things. Nearly all the park is a profound solitude, yet it is full of charming company, full of God's thoughts. A place of peace and safety amid the most exalted grandeur and eager enthusiastic action. A new song, a place of beginnings abounding in first lessons on life. Mountain building, eternal, invincible, unbreakable order, with sermons in stones and storms, trees and flowers, and animals brimful of humanity. During the last glacial period just past, the former features of the range were rubbed off as a chalk sketch from a blackboard, and a new beginning was made. Hence the wonderful clearness and freshness of the rocky pages. John Muir is, or considered, the first environmentalist. He, when he was a young boy, moved to Wisconsin, and then as a young adult, decided to go to California to explore. And one of his first adventures was in the area that is Yosemite in the Sierra Nevada mountains. He then found a job and tried to make his way back where he found a job the next year as a shepherd and he took the sheep. He, he worked at, in the in the Sierra Nevada area with um, being a shepherd to the sheep. But what he learned from that experience is the damage that ranching can do to fragile ecosystems. And it started exploration for him. He ended up working for this um, this logging company, and he ended up building himself a log house out of the woods, the wood in the Yosemite Park. And he built his house so that he could um, divert part of the river to run underneath it so that he could listen to the water all night long. Um, he is why much of the national park system has come to be in the way it has. And Yosemite is one of those places. He took one of our presidents, Teddy Roosevelt, um, he helped him escape from his Secret Service agents, and they went camping in Yosemite for three days. And out of that experience, Muir wanted to push the president to make the parks more stable, to expand the land around it, and to get it help in funding it. And by taking him out into the park to see the wild, Teddy Roosevelt is, as most of you know, the, the, the president that helped to found and create many of our national parks. But the thing they describe about Muir, especially when he's taking anybody on a tour of Yosemite, is how just incredibly excited and passionate that he is about it. Like he bounces so much in his enthusiasm for the parks. One of the things that Yosemite has that, that fits with the story of Moses, I think, is that Moses has had this problem of the people trusting him completely, right? They trust him a little bit. Right? So they do decide after plagues have come down and Pharaoh says you can go that well maybe we should leave since we brought plagues on the country, right? And so they trust him to set off, but then as soon as they meet the first challenge, a little body of water, they get angry or grumbly and complaining. And yet they make it through the body of water. And then they get out into a place that is dry and barren, and they worry about being fed, about having water, and they complain again and again to Moses. And so there's this push and pull between him and the people, and between him and the people and God, about 
trusting each other, about trusting each other enough to believe that they can make it, that they can make it through, that they can build this new community together. And one of the ways I think you can illustrate that is why I have all those pictures of mountain climbing. All right, who's ever been mountain climbing? Not me either, because that terrifies me. Like, when I was thinking about how do we talk about trust, I don't know if you have ever had to go on a trust walk. Um, so it's one of those things that they make you do at camp or when you go to college because they want you to trust those new people that you've never met in this strange foreign place. And so I remember the time in college, so I'm like 18 or 19, and they want me to fall back into the arms of all these people that I do not know. I will let you know a thing about me. I don't have that kind of trust. I really, like, because in order to do it safely, you, the person falling, has to be rigid. Like, you can't bend your body, you can't bend your legs. And I, like, I just couldn't do it, because falling backwards is just, like, when they offered it forwards, I could do forward. But the whole going back, that trust element is really hard. And we can see that in the story of Moses and the Israelites, right? Trusting each other is really hard. They are working out how do we live together as a new people? How do we live together in this space that is uncertain? In this place that feels dangerous? Well, in mountain climbing, there is a lot of trust, right? You have to learn to trust your own ability, right? To know that you can reach that next spot. You have to trust that those things that they screw into the mountain, the cams and carbines, will hold, right? Because at Yosemite, uh, especially El Capitan, it is one of the mountain climbers' dream places to go mountain climbing. There are multiple different areas and paths that you can take, some of which already have the ropes strung up it. So it's not like you're going to be on your own. So to get to the top of El Capitan, they said it's the size of three, um, three Empire State Buildings stacked on top of each other that to actually climb to the top of it freestyle takes you an entire day. That would be non-stop to get all the way to the top. Most people take two or three days. It would be another trust factor for me because you have to fall asleep on the side of the mountain strapped in. That's a lot of trust. Right? You're trusting in the ropes not to fray. You're trusting in all the metal parts not to be rusted and broken. You're trusting in the people that are with you to help rescue you if you were to fall. And so there are many ways to go up El Capitan. You can do it with other people on those lines that have already been falled so that you are hooked up and using the ropes to um, save you if you fall. You can freestyle some of the areas where you are not using somebody else's ropes or somebody else's, um, the places where people have gone before um, to get up the mountain. You can set up and do it. The first woman just did it a few years ago. I don't have that kind of trust. It scares me, right? Like. I, I think you have to be you have to be young when you start it when you're more fearless because you have to believe that it's possible that it's possible to scale the side of that sheer rock like when see sheer it's like it's not there is not a path there is a path so you can get to the top of that without climbing like there's a driving there's a, a, a way that you can get there that 
But lots of people do what she does, climb the mountain. A belief in this trust. So in our scripture today, God says to Moses, I want to help the people learn to trust you, right? Like, I want to share with them an experience that will help them to realize that I am with them and with you. And that when you're speaking, when you're telling people about how to live and how to be, how to live into what it means to be the Israelites, to be this Jewish community, I want them to trust you enough to believe your word. So one of the things that you might not catch, because we read the story disjointedly, is that this is a circle that has just been completed when we arrive at chapter 19. Because in chapter 3, we started out on the same mountain. This is the mountain that Moses saw the burning bush, received his call from God to go and free his people. This mountain. And now, three new moons later, the people have arrived at that same mountain. A mountain on which God has said, when you have freed the people, you will bring them to this holy mountain where they will worship me. So we come in a full circle back to the place where it started, back to the mountain where Moses encountered God. And on this mountain, God tells Moses, now that you are here, now that you are in this place, these people, these people are my people. These people are my people, and we will be in relationship with each other. We will form a bond that binds us together. And then the rest of the book is the rules, right? The rules that make up the community. But on this day, as Moses is there on the mountain, and he goes up the mountain, and God says, I'm glad you made it. I want you to tell the people that they are my people. And I am going to show them that they can trust you. Goes back down the mountain. The people say, yes, we'll do this. So he comes back up. God promises that the people will trust him because here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show my presence. Only not completely. Because in the section that I didn't read in chapter 19, he sets out all these rules. And let me tell you, the feminist in me is sort of a, ooh, I can't believe you wrote that in the scriptures. <laughs> but the men had to get prepared to be able to meet God. And so, of course, you know that meant staying away from women for three days, because apparently we can't meet God. So, the men prepare themselves to meet God. And God comes to them in a cloud that surrounds him and Moses. And they hear God speak in the sound of thunder, sharing with Moses the words. God appears to them in this cloud that, if you remember previously, there was a cloud that helped them make their way through the desert. Helped them guide them. So this cloud, with the presence of God, is available for those men to experience. And for those men to learn that Moses is trustworthy, that God is trustworthy, and that we, we will be a people together. How do we learn that kind of trust? Because one of the things I thought about in this scripture is that if we were to take it literally, right? What it says to us is that God promises 
if we do all the things, that we will be blessed. And we as pastors have used that blessing to tell you that if you do all the right things, then all the right things will come to you. But that's not how life works. Life is challenging and difficult, and there will always be heartache and heartbreak. And God can't stop that. It is going to happen. So what is the promise? What is the trust that God is trying to create with us? Because it isn't that you are now going to be blessed with wealth and family and however many children, because this is the group of people that are always promised a blessing of multiple children. That isn't always the case. It doesn't always happen. And yet we're asked to trust anyway. To believe that God does bless us. That God will be present for us. That God will be there showing us how to live into community. How to live into the group of people that can be a community to each other. And it isn't always easy because some of us are grumpy. And I will put my cat, myself in that category a lot. Some of us are grumpy some of the time. And some of us grumble some of the time. And some of us get frustrated when things don't move the way we think they should. But what God is promising us is that God will be present. Because when all those grumblings happen, God was there. God was there when we needed freedom. God was there when we were hungry. God was there when we searched out for water. And God was there when we needed leaders to lead us. God promises us to be there and to show us some of the rules, some of the boundaries that make for a good community, that make for a place of trust. Amen. Amen.